Uh, we're in the week number nine. Today is the finale of Blueprints, and we've been studying the book of Acts, and the book of Acts is uh, a beautiful book talking about the beginnings of God's church, um, and we've said this every week. We're going to say it again, that his plan for the church then is still his plan for the church now. He has not changed his mind. Nothing is different. And what God wants to do uh, in your life is a beautiful reflection of the legacy that we're living in from the people who were 2,000 years before us. We've taken a nine-week journey through this book, and it's really an extraordinary account, just a beautiful story of what God did through people, through their faithful obedience. And the church was established through the power of the Holy Spirit and the faithful obedience of people. And honestly, that is still the plan today. It is still power and obedience. It is still power and obedience. Nothing's changed. From the moment that the Holy Spirit descended at Pentecost all the way to Paul's ministry under house arrest, the church of Jesus Christ displayed a very undeniable truth that the church of Jesus Christ is unstoppable. Somebody say amen to that. In fact, that's the message titled today, A Spirit-Filled Church is an Unstoppable Church. We're going to talk about how we're going to live in the legacy of the book of Acts, how the church is unstoppable. Look at this scripture, Acts 28, the end of the book of Acts. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own house and welcomed all who came to him. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about Jesus with all boldness and without hindrance. Another translation says it this way, Paul welcomed, welcomed all who visited him, visited him when he was under house arrest. See, you can. this is a beautiful picture, right, of how it was unstoppable. The government thought they could keep the gospel from spreading, but Paul just started having house parties, inviting everybody to his house. You can't stop the church. Telling them with all boldness, somebody say boldness, about the kingdom of God and about the Lord Jesus Christ and no one tried to stop him. Have you ever had somebody kind of running full force at you? Maybe you haven't, I don't know. But if you've had, if you saw somebody just coming at you, um, and, or it's Red Rover, Red Rover, and you're like, I'm going to die, I'm just going to move. You know, it's like you, somebody's coming at you, and you can tell there's no stopping this person, and your only instinct is to really get out of the way. This is really what it was. The church was moving so strongly that, there, that there, was no, there was no stopping the church. A lot like there was no stopping Texas as they whooped on OU yesterday. I'm just saying, I had to get it out of the way in the beginning, all right? Just, just say, if that hits you in the wrong spot, there's time to get saved later. I mean, you can come down here. We're not all, we didn't all come in here save Longhorns. It's all right. But when somebody's coming at you that hard, you're, you just back off. Just let it run its course. That's really what was going on with the church. The church was moving so quickly and boldly, and not rudely, but boldly and, and, and strongly with conviction. Another translation says it this way, they were speaking triumphantly without any restrictions. Triumphantly. What is there triumphant about being under house arrest? You know, you might think that well, there, was, there, there was such a move of the Spirit, nothing could stop them, not even the walls of the home could stop them. And there was a reason behind it, and it's because confidence is birthed out of conviction. And you can't, you've, have you ever met somebody who's, you know, selling things door to door and they don't really believe in what they're selling. They're just trying to make some money and go home. They don't really believe in solar panels. They just need money. They're not like jazzed up about solar energy. They just need to pay the rent. They're not jazzed up about Kirby vacuum cleaners. They just really need to pay the rent. It, you can tell when somebody's just telling you something to tell you something. You can tell when somebody at their core won't drop it. Like it's in their gut, it's in their soul, it's in their conviction. There, there's a confidence that comes out of conviction. Today we're going to conclude our nine-week journey as we continue to reflect on the book of Acts. So let's not treat it as a historical record book alone, which it is, but as a living guide for us today, the blueprint for our lives. Acts began with the promise that we would be filled with the Spirit and be filled with boldness, and it ends with Paul under house arrest, still preaching and teaching with boldness and being filled with the Spirit. The story of the book of Acts is a story of an unstoppable church. 
empowered by the Holy Spirit. And that same Spirit is alive in us today. So let me pray real quick. Father, would our hearts and minds be open to your word today? Would there be something that is said today that would be an answer to something we've maybe been thinking about for a while? And if we walked in here today with anything that is pretty heavy, hard to deal with, something we've been worried about for a long time, maybe something that even happened yesterday, this morning, whatever it is, God, you love us enough that you know exactly what that is and you'll speak to it today. So we open up our hearts and our minds to you to speak. And we say yes to it. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's talk about the unstoppable church. And I'm going to move through this quickly because there are some thoughts. I have a couple of thoughts for you. And with a, under each thought, there is a fact and a truth and a challenge for you. So if you're not normally a note taker, that's okay. Just take pictures of the slides as they come up because I want you to be able to respond to these questions in our response time, which we'll have at the end of the message. So I'm going to move through it and give you more time to respond today. We're going to talk about the unstoppable church, a spirit-filled church. Number one is a church empowered by the Holy Spirit, not running fruitful programs or slick programming, which we all need and love, and I love smooth-running programs, but is it empowered by the Holy Spirit? From the very beginning, the book of Acts reveals that the church was not built on human effort, but on the power of the Holy Spirit. They weren't doing anything in their own effort to convince the Holy Spirit to come. They were just waiting out of obedience to their Savior, and that faithfulness and obedience attracted the Spirit of the Lord. The day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 marks the birth of the church as the Spirit-filled believers were then filled with boldness and gifts. You know, the Holy Spirit gives you gifts. Some of you were born with the gift of singing, and some of you were passed up on that line. It's okay. Uh, some of you were born with gifts of administration, and some of us still can't find our car keys. There's 10 sets around town somewhere. Uh, there, it's, it, we've all been given different gifts and abilities and strengths, and, and, and when, the, when the, something is a gift to you, it's not difficult. There's no striving involved. It's a gift for you. And, and, and not that we all can't learn in different ways, but there's some, we're just given these gifts by uh, the Lord. And the Holy Spirit fills us with boldness to use these gifts and then gives us a passion for the lost, a passion for people who don't know Jesus yet. And that empowerment, let me say it this way, was not a one-time event. It continued through the book of Acts, and it remains essential Today, the church, a spirit-filled church, an unstoppable church is empowered by the Holy Spirit. So here's the first fact and truth. The same spirit that empowered Peter, Paul, Stephen, and countless others is available to us today. Somebody say amen. There's nothing special about Peter, nothing special about Paul. Nothing special about Stephen. They weren't gifted from birth with an extra dose of boldness. They were regular people who had a genuine encounter with Jesus and lined their life up to their Savior. And when opposition came, they met the call. And you and I are here talking about it today because of what people like they, what they, them did. The baptism of the Holy Spirit equips us for ministry just like he did them. Gives us a supernatural boldness just like he did Stephen before he was martyred. And unites the body unites the body of Christ. There's so much going on in our world today, especially in an election year that seeks to divide, that seeks to define us by every little tiny thing. When the gospel actually erases all of those divisions and brings us all into unity in Christ, you'll never find the word diversity in the Bible as a value. We are sons and daughters of God, and that unites us. When we're divided, we get hurt. When we're divided, we lose strength. When we're divided, we die. But the gospel seeks to unite every single one of us, and the Holy Spirit equips us in that unity. So here's the challenge to you. Are you relying on the Spirit's power, 
Are you trying to do God's work on your own strength? And maybe if we took God's out of it, are you relying on the Spirit's power? Or are you trying to do your, your job in your own strength, your marriage on your own strength? What, what are you trying to do on your own strength? Are you trying to plan your future on your own strength? Because we can do a lot on our own. And when we do a lot on our own, we get tired. But you'll never find anywhere in the Bible where it says, blessed are those who strive and are stressed. Are, are we relying on the Spirit's empowerment? And a lot of you came into this room today barely walking because you're exhausted. You're emotionally spent. You're emotionally exhausted. You're, you're spiritually depleted. And you got to ask the question, why? Because you might feel like you're doing all the right things. You're saying all the right things. You're singing all the right songs. You, you started listening to Christian music. You stopped listening to talk radio. You started doing everything you could to fill yourself up. And you're still feel, feeling tired. And I wonder if we're praying prayers like this. And I can tell a difference when I don't give my day to the Lord like this and a difference when I do. But if our prayers sound like this in the morning, there's a really good chance that you're opening up yourself to the Holy Spirit to lead and guide and provide and empower. If we say things like, Father, thank you for sending your son to die for me. Thank you for sending your spirit to fill me, empower me, equip me, counsel, and lead me. I don't know what I'm going to face today, but I know I can't do it in my own power. So whatever I face today, would you fill me? Would you empower me? Would you speak to me? Would you guide me? Would you put me in the right rooms with the right people at the right time? And may I lean on your spirit, not my own understanding today. You pray prayers like that, your antennas are going to be up the rest of that day, and you'll begin to see the spirit work in your mind, your heart, and your mouth. It changes the dynamic of how our day goes. So are you relying? If you're praying prayers like that, that's great. Keep doing it. Do it as often every day as you need to. If you're not praying prayers like that in the morning, I'm 99.9% .9 sure you think you got it handled. And so you've got to start out your life and your day with relying on the Spirit's power. Because a, a, an unstoppable Christian is one who relies on the Spirit's power. A stoppable Christian is the one who gets tired and just fills their life up with spiritual activity, hoping that impresses God enough. And so an unstoppable Spirit-filled church is empowered by the Holy Spirit. And you're going to have a chance to respond to these things. So if you're feeling tired and you're just wore down and, and you're doing a lot of things on your own and your own power, if you're going to work and you're, you're workplace does not feel more encouraged and more joyful and more productive because you're there, but now everyone in the workroom thinks your boss is the Antichrist because you started that rumor. You know, if there's, are you relying on the Spirit's power or not? So let's remember to constantly seek the Holy Spirit's empowerment in all that we do. Constantly seek His empowerment. Number two, an unstoppable Spirit-filled church is a church on mission. And what this means is, Acts is a story of a church that understood its mission. And in a church that's on mission, and we say this at Growth Track sometimes, is that in a church that's on mission, nobody gets what they want. Nobody gets, like, we're not here to get what we want. We're here to worship him and do what he wants. And a lot of times, has anyone, can anyone agree with this? A lot of times what God has wanted from you is not what you wanted. And so we see that a lot, that our humanity collides with eternity and with kingdom values, and we adjust to the plumb line. And so we see a church that's on mission. Life looks different for them, and even in their culture, life was dangerous to be a Christian. And they adjusted their life to that, uh, to that plumb line. They were on mission. In fact, they, they became, it was the Great Commission, to be witnesses to their local, regional, state, international authorities. They, they, they were not just, that mission was not just relegated to the apostles either, by the way. It was ordinary believers, men, women, Jews, Gentiles, that carried the message everywhere they went, their neighborhoods, their HOA board meetings. How many know Jesus needs to be in an HOA board meeting? I mean, it's like 
school board meetings, whatever it was, wherever they went, they brought Jesus with them. They were on mission. They, they, they think of it this way in our terms, instead of hating their neighbor and their yappy dog, instead of dreaming about the antifreeze you could put through the fence, don't, do, don't Google it, don't do it. You're dreaming about why does that neighbor... What is in that home or in them that acts like they hate me? The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and rulers of the air. There's a spiritual thing going on there. And maybe, just maybe, that seller that you bought the house from accepted your offer because God needed you next door to that person to change their family tree forever. If we're on mission as the church, we think like that. Now, I'm not saying you can't hate someone's yappy dog. They should put the dang thing in the house. I'm with you. However, if we are on mission, our lives look different. So here's the fact. This mission is not optional. This mission is not optional. It wasn't optional for them. The Great Commission was not optional for them. The Great Commission was and still is the heartbeat of the church. And we are called to share the gospel wherever we are, in whatever situation we find ourselves. And just like the early church, we're going to face opposition, persecution, challenges, but the message must go forward. And most of the time when the mission comes to call, it won't be at a time that is convenient for you. It won't be at a time that's convenient. And and I'm, I'm one of these guys that I know I seem extroverted, but when I'm in a store, I just, I'm on a mission. Like, I'm not there to make friends. I don't need y'all to be my friend. I just need to get to the steak aisle and get home. That's all I need to do. When I'm at Costco, I'm running the toilet paper and running back out. Like, when I'm at Home Depot, I know exactly where I'm going to go. I stay there longer than any other store. But it's like this, I got things to do. You know, I got play. Like, so I, I have to, like, get out of myself and open up my eyes to who's around me. And even when I, I had to change barbers because my barber retired, and that's a very hard decision, by the way. <laughs> my barber retired, and she was great. She was Korean, didn't speak English, didn't talk to me. I was in and out in 12 minutes. It was beautiful. <laughs> Nami and I had a wonderful relationship for seven years, and she ruined it by retiring. How dare she? And I end up in this new barber shop, and everybody talks. I'm there longer. It's farther away. I was so aggravated by the inconvenience. But, and I started telling Kelly, I was like, maybe I'm there for a reason. Out of all the barbershops in town, I ended up there. And just last week, I went to the barbershop, and we ended up having this conversation about spiritual warfare with people in that barbershop that were not Christians. And some of them were coming out of Catholicism, were asking questions, and It turned into this moment about finding Jesus in your life, not looking for a demon under every bush. Like, stop rubbing a a necklace from someone who's dead and start talking to Jesus. And, And find Jesus in your life, not superstition. And they were like, how do I do that? And so I ordered books and had them sent to their home. They arrived yesterday. Bought one of them a Bible, and he was reading Acts. He goes, what does that mean? First time in their life they've ever read a Bible. If I just kept my head down, I'd have ended up at a really weird place with my hair all cut up like a weed whacker, and, no, and none of these folks would have met Jesus. You know, it's like there's, there's something powerful about being on mission, and we've, we've all got to come out of ourselves and see the mission field we're in, whether it's a grumpy Walmart greeter, uh, a broken down computer in a, a checkout line, or your kids were frustrating you that day, and you end up at the DMV, and it really hell's there that day. And it's like you're, you end up in these moments where you don't want to look up, but it's in those moments often where the greatest mission field sits. The mission was not optional. You and I are called to share the gospel wherever we are. So here's the challenge. Have you embraced that in your own life? Have you embraced the Great Commission? Or you just get home and shut your windows and hide from neighbors? Have you embraced the Great Commission? Have you, have, you, have you looked up and seen who's around you? Are there people that you might be friends with right now and you love them as friends, but you're going to heaven and they're not? 
Have you shared with them the greatest thing that's ever happened to you, or are you just drinking buddies? Because I don't know about you, but I don't want to get to heaven and God say, I'm glad you had a lot of cigars with those fellas, but they're all in hell. You get what I'm saying? Like there's, have you embraced this in your life? And if you are a Christian, this great commission is not optional. Sharing Jesus, and are you going to, are you going to be nervous? Yeah, you're going to be nervous. Even for you extroverts, you're going to be nervous. You're going to get clammy like you're going on your first date. You're, four, you're going to feel 14 again. And you're going to be all nervous. Your hands are going to be sweaty. Your heart's going to be beating fast. But guess what I've noticed? The more bold I am with sharing with people the greatest gift God's ever given me, the more open they are and receptive and grateful they are that I talk to them. And we're, we come up with these ideas in our head of the worst is going to happen, but most of the time that won't be the case. So have you embraced that in your own life? Because the unstoppable church did. That's why it was such a force that they couldn't stop. They shared Jesus. And so let's renew our commitment, everybody, to share the gospel with conviction. And if you don't have that conviction about the gospel, have you truly met Jesus? Because if you've truly met Jesus, there is a soul-level conviction that everybody's got to know about this guy. Like, they got to know. Because I was destined for hell. But look what my Savior did. He found me in my deepest, darkest sin. He came looking for me. He left the 91, 99 and kept looking for the one. I was the one about to fall off a cliff, and my shepherd grabbed me and took me to safety. Everybody needs to know that shepherd. Somebody say a louder amen to that truth today. So we have to renew our commitment to that. Number three, an unstoppable spirit-filled church is a church unified in purpose. There's not division. There is a unity of where the church is headed, where the church is going. What is she supposed to do? Throughout the book of Acts, we see that unity was the key to growth of the early church. The Holy Spirit filled a bunch of obedient believers, and then they, in unity, marched forward with that new empowerment. They didn't keep going backwards. They kept moving forward. They stayed with each other. They fought with each other. They cried with each other. They helped each other. They were unified in the direction of the church. They remained united in prayer, even through external threats and even internal threats, like in Acts 6 when the Hellenistic Jews were being overlooked in the bread line so all the Jewish widows could have bread. So someone who was running the food line was literally playing racial favorites. One of the church's first issues was a racial issue. And then the apostles were like, we ain't dealing with that. We got to keep praying. We're going to keep preaching. You guys find seven people who are trustworthy and filled with the Holy Ghost and let them handle it. That was the first mass hiring of the church in Acts chapter 6. Seven people, and then everybody was cared for. They're like, we're going to keep praying and focusing on unity. You guys start handling what's on the ground. We're going to take care of everybody. I think it's interesting that some of the things the church faced then are some of the very things the devil's trying to use to divide the church now. But if we do what the early church did, we're going to be okay. We're going to be okay because it's still his plan. They were unified on purpose. They were unified in direction. And the fact is the church today, you and I, we're the church, right? We established that weeks ago must strive for that same unity. We have to strive for clarity, strive for unity about where the church is headed. And can I tell you something? Anytime you start getting cold feet, and usually that phrase is used for what? Marriage and before a wedding. But by cold feet, I mean when you're in a church and you're like, I'm just no longer being fed there. That usually means there's something going on here that isn't sitting well, and you've not prayed the prayer, God, search me and know me. What's going on in here? Because as long as we're talking, the devil loses. He's a coward and can only work in silence and darkness. So if we turn on the lights, the roaches scatter. Anyone remember your first apartment? And so the roaches scatter. It's the same thing. We turn on the light, we talk, and watch the devil run. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. It's a biblical promise. So we strive for the same unity they strive for. They strive for it. They fought for it. 
They didn't, they, they, they didn't let division be an option. They strived for unity. And in a world divided by politics, race, culture, class, we must be a witness to the world that the kingdom of God can walk in love, humility, and unity. And know that we, you and I need to understand that division will weaken our witness, but unity strengthens our impact. If we can bind together, we'll be as unstoppable as the early church. So here's the challenge for you. How can you better reflect the unity of the early church? How can you in your life better reflect the unity of the early church in this church? And these are open-ended questions for a reason. This is like the hard beef jerky. It's going to taste good. It tastes good. It's got to chew it a while. It'll go down eventually. Just keep chewing. You got to think about it. How, how, how can I better reflect? For some of us, it might be, I need to be at church every Sunday. I need to stop making excuses and I need to be there. I, 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 need, to, I, I need to stop playing games spiritually and get some stuff together. I, I need to stop listening to those voices that would seek to divide and plant my roots and stop making other things an option. I, how, how, like, how can I better reflect it? And think about that in prayer. Even think about it today, because later on in response time, I believe God is going to speak to you today. Do you believe God can speak to you today? He, the creator of the universe can speak directly to you today. And I know he can do that because do you think it's an accident that God sent you out of all the beautiful buildings you could have parked your car in? God sent you to an elementary school cafeteria in a town that no one can spell to hear a message today. Isn't it amazing that God did that. You're not here by accident today to hear a message like this today. And so begin to ask yourself, what is God, going, what is God saying to you? How can you better reflect unity? For some of us, it might be stop gossiping. Stop gossiping. Stop entertaining dishonor. Stop entertaining little side comments and backbiting. Stop entertaining that. You know what? The Bible says law, all of that is just as, as severe as the sin of witchcraft. You're like, oh, well, I would never have a voodoo doll, only of my neighbor's dog. You know, it's like, but it's, it's, a, it's the same hit to the gut to your spiritual life, the Bible says, as witchcraft. And I think if you and I can get our hearts in line with heaven, we'll start to have our antennas up about conversations and things that um, are, are an issue there. And so how can we be more unified? The unstoppable church was in complete unity, even in the middle of internal issues and external opposition. They were that strong. Number four, an unstoppable, unstoppable spirit-filled church is a church that overcomes that opposition. One of the most powerful themes in the book of Acts is the church's resilience in the face of persecution. From Peter and John being arrested in Acts 4, to Stephen's martyrdom in Acts 7, to Paul's countless trials and beatings and imprisonment, the early believers refused to back down. They were not taking no for an answer. Their boldness in their face and in their faith in the face of suffering are a reminder that nothing can stop the church that is focused on God's agenda. And and we've seen a lot of opposition as a church. And and Kelly and I didn't know, I didn't know about the video today or Pastor Appreciation Day. It's not like a thing on our calendar that we like look forward to. You know, it's like, it's just, it pops up in October and it surprises us every year. We're grateful for it and thank you all for being so honoring. But it gives us time to reflect and look back at, it's been a long 10 years of this church. And we look back at the opposition that we encountered. We look back at days like November of 20. 20, when were you born? 20, uh, when was it? Yeah, yeah, 2011. No, no, 2014. It was Bradley, not you. You were already here. 2014. And they were like, your equipment isn't coming for launch day. I said, excuse me? Kind of got like 65 people rallied up and pumped up about this opening of a church. Now, we won't have any equipment at all. And they're like, you're going to need an extra $38,000 in the next 48 hours before they'll drive trailers from Michigan to Texas. 
And we got it. That was an opposition. That was a faith moment. That was a big deal. Being in six venues in nine years, that was a big deal. It's a lot of opposition, but what we need to understand is that God is already in tomorrow and he's doing things we don't know. Because here's the fact, in today's world, the church still faces opposition. Whether it's from secularism, like all the, those churches that are preaching things that are not biblical, they're just trying to cozy up with culture for the sake of growth and attendance. And it's truly demonic what actually is happening in those moments whether from secularism, hostility towards Christianity, or cultural pressure, the church is still facing opposition today, that if you don't fall in line, you get canceled. Uh, the church has been facing opposition since the 2008 election, that every single year, the federal government is attempting to take away tax-exempt status from churches, not mosques or synagogues, just churches. And if that happened, then churches all over America would have to foreclose on their properties. It would be a massive blow uh, to the church. And all I know is that if that ever does happen, God's already in tomorrow. It didn't take him by surprise. Whoever wins the election in three weeks does not determine how far the gospel can go. Because put me on house arrest. I'll just start having house parties. Tell us we can't gather at church. We're just going to get really good at video stuff. Whatever it's all called. I called it video stuff. They were like, stand here and talk here. Got it. All right, let's do it. You can't stop the church. You can't stop the church because we have to understand this. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Greater is he that is in my tomorrow than he that's barking down my neck today. Like, greater is he that is in me. So here's the challenge are you prepared to stand firm in the face of opposition? Are you prepared? And I thank God every day that we weren't one of the 25,000 churches in the United States that closed in 2020. 25,000 churches. That God saw our church through 2020 and three venue changes in 12 months. And we're all grateful that God delivers us out of the hand of the Live Oak Theater. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Those who are clapping know what it was like to push cases up that padded carpet ramp. That'll test your salvation all day long. Are we prepared to stand firm when things don't go the way we prayed for? Are we prepared to face opposition when we're told no, 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 no? Are we prepared to face opposition? But we have to trust God that he will give us the strength and the courage to overcome whatever challenges come our way. We have to trust him. So when we were losing venues and the venue we were in in San Antonio got shut down by the government because the guy was running a Ponzi scheme and all that stuff, when all that happened, that was outside our control, we were wondering, what is, what is happening? What are we going to do? Kelly had an idea. She said, let's just try the school district again. And I said, Kelly, they have already told me no a thousand times. They're probably tired of hearing from me. It, it, you know, I was, the na I was like, this is not going to work. She's like, let's just try it. She got a hold of the principal that was here at the time, and she was only here for a short time. She's now the head principal at Schlother Intermediate. But she was the principal here. At that time, all three of our kiddos came to the school, uh, and Kelly called her. And what we did not know is that she was here for a short time um, as the head principal to move up to be the head principal there. And in that short time, she had called her friend at district office that they had been childhood friends and said, hey, if, if this church ever asks, I want it to already be in order for my yes, so get all the paperwork ready. That was before we even asked. And so when Kelly called, she said, Easy. It's already all done. God is in your tomorrow, everybody. See, we were the first church, the first church in SCUC history to be allowed to use one of their buildings. Don't say God can't do it. 
God will put someone in the government in a position of authority to make room for the gospel to be preached. And there are dozens of people getting baptized later, and we're going to give the devil a black eye on government property because he's in our tomorrow. I just get all like Holy Ghost sassy over stuff like that. But we, we have to be prepared to face opposition, whatever it looks like. But if we're in unity, we can hold each other up. When opposition comes and we're divided, we crumble. So we've got to stand together. So let's trust that God's going to give us that courage and that strength. And then number five, and the last one, an unstoppable spirit-filled church is a church that continues the story. Churches that continue the story understand the legacy of the book of Acts. The book of Acts ends abruptly, by the way. It ends with Paul still preaching in Rome. And this unfinished ending you ever watched a movie and the ending is like, you decide. I can't stand those kinds of movies. Just tell, does he live or die? You decide. You ever watch Shutter Island? I'm like, so was he crazy? <laughs> Kelly and I had like a two hour long argument after watching Shutter Island. And I was like, no, Kelly, like he was, no, she was like, no, he was an inmate. I'm like, you're being so negative. He wasn't crazy. He was the guy trying to help. I'm like, nope, he was crazy. He was hearing wolves. It doesn't make sense. It's just back and forth, back and forth. It's like, just tell me how it ends. But even in an abrupt ending, here's the beauty of it. This unfinished ending suggests that the work of the Holy Spirit through the church is ongoing. There's no ending to the book of Acts. One of the only book in the Bible where there's no ending. Do you think that is a coincidence? I don't believe there are coincidences in the Bible. The leaders of the Purpose Church don't believe in coincidences or accidents. That there was something on purpose about leaving the book of Acts unfinished. Because we are part of that story. Acts is not just a book of history, it's a living testimony about what God wants to do through his people. So here's the fact for you. You and I are the next chapter of the book of Acts. We are the next chapter of the Acts of the church. And, it's, and we just call it Acts, but that, that book title is literally the Acts of the church or the Acts of the apostles. So what if it's like the, the Acts of Landon? The Acts of Sandra? When you put yourself in that position and you see yourself as a continuation of the story you realize that the church did did not end with Paul and house arrest it continues through me it continues through us the Holy Spirit is still working does anybody believe that he's still empowering he's still sending us to be witnesses in all of the areas of our lives so here's the challenge what role are you gonna play in continuing the story of Acts. Because if we're in Christianity just to avoid hell, that's not a bad thing. None of us want to go there. It's not a bad thing. But what role are you going to play to continue the story? God has empowered you with gifts and talents to use on purpose to continue the story of the book of Acts. That's why Growth Track exists is to help you figure that out so we can get you started in a safe place with great leaders and great team leaders that can help you walk out that purpose. But will you be found faithful to Jesus and his church? Will you be empowered by the Spirit, united in purpose and bold in vision? Or will we be found, like New Testament calls, whitewashed tombs? We look beautiful on the outside, but we're full of dead men's bones. We look the part, but inside there's no life. What role are you going to play? What role are you going to play to continue the story? Because this right here is actually what the devil is going to try to remind you of all the time, that you're too jacked up, you've done too much, you've said too much, you've been around too much, you're too far gone, there's too many things that have happened in your life, and God knows about it. 
And there's an accusation. The Bible calls the devil the great accuser of the brethren. His name by definition means accuser. So if you're feeling accused, that's not God. Because conviction leads to peace and life change. Accusation leads to shame and depression. So if you're feeling stressed and tired and worried and anxious and sad and depressed about what's going on in your life right now, that's not God. So this question might even be hard for you to stomach, but there is. Can I just encourage you for a minute? There are gifts and talents and beauty in you put there by your creator at conception that God hardwired into you and that you, according to manufacturer specifications, are unstoppable. And the only reason we would stop is because we believed a lie that we are not driving the vehicle. That God has given you the gifts and the talents, but we have handed over the keys to the accuser. And he's driving off a cliff. But guess what? Today, today, you can set the record straight. And you can say, I'm not what I have been being accused of. I am not too broken. I am not too from this type of family. I am, I am not too messed up. I am not defined by what I've said, who I've slept with, what I've done, how I cheated, how I lied. I am not defined by my old life. And I won't let him accuse me anymore that I am a child of God. I'm a son of God. I'm a daughter of God, called on purpose for a purpose, filled with the Holy Spirit, gifted by the Spirit to do something beyond my own power. And I'm going to stop thinking like that and I'm going to turn toward my creator because he's got the answer and I'll be found faithful and I want to be further empowered I want to be further in unity I want to be plugged into boldness and vision I'm going to stop using the church for my own spiritual gratification and I'm going to be the church for someone whose family tree has only known hell but they'll now forever know heaven because I said yes what role are you going to play what role are you going to play? And today, as we get ready for response time, you've got an opportunity to set the record straight. And as we conclude our message today, I want us to remember that the same spirit that moved in the early church is still here. The same mission, the same power, the same unity, the same spiritually stubborn, dogged determination that's required of us. If we are to be unstoppable, personally and as a body, we've got to be on the same mission. And, by the, and, and by, the mission is not just to have a nice little church where people can preach and we'll all love each other. That will happen, but that's not the goal. The goal, the mission is that our church's name comes out of the city council's mouth when they need something. That when the school district is facing an issue, we come up first for help. That when the devil wants to come into Comal, Guadalupe, or Bear County, he better ask permission first. And the answer is already no. That there is a spiritual authority, not just a church influence. A church can influence a city in a good way. Does it have authority over the city? Is there spiritual authority where the devil's like, there's a gate there and we don't have a passcode? Where people want to move here because there's something different about that neighborhood. There's something different about that place. There's something different about that school zone. There's something different about the government there. There's something different. There's a mission there, not just to have a good church, but to have spiritual authority on the corridor. The same power being filled with the spirit even if it looks different than maybe you and I thought, having the same unity that we fight for that no matter the cost and have the same perseverance that we're not backing off, we're not divorcing our church family, we're, not, we're gonna talk and we're gonna stop letting the devil win. This is required to be an unstoppable spirit-filled church. We have an opportunity today to respond to that because as we wrap up this series, I wanna tell you we're walking into one of our greatest seasons of the year and we call it legacy. It starts next week. And this is a perfect time for you and I to be thinking about what am I doing 
that will make my ceiling be the floor for the next person? What am I contributing? My time, my talent, my treasure, what am I doing to be the church in order for someone else whose family tree has only known sickness, depression, cancer, health and divorce, unhealth and divorce, to now know life and life abundantly. What am I doing to help be an answer to that? As we walk into the legacy series, we have to understand that we are living in the legacy of those that were written of in the book of Acts. We are living in their legacy. And the only reason we're living in their legacy is because they weren't lily footing around the mission. They were all in. They were dedicated disciples that lived their life on the plumb line of Christ, not asking God to bless their disobedience. But that we were moving forward on the same mission as a church. And if you're like, Landon, I was just trying out churches. I just need a good church with good coffee and make sure they don't lose my kid. Well, we'll do all of those things, but perhaps God sent you here because he's tired of you sitting on the sideline. And he sent you here on purpose to sit in those chairs in a cafeteria to hear a message about stop sitting on the sideline and ask God how you can be a spirit-filled, unstoppable disciple and what changes need to be made. So as the prayer team comes down to the front, everybody stand to your feet. one more thing to read and it's a final call to action that I wrote for us to end our series with and if you want this final call to action just put your hand over your heart just to signify I want this to go deep let us be a church empowered by the Holy Spirit relentless in mission united in love and bold in the face of opposition. The work of God's kingdom continues and we are privileged to be a part of it. Go out with confidence knowing that you are the spirit-filled, unstoppable church of Jesus Christ, carrying his message of salvation, hope, and purpose to the world. The prayer team is here. They're going to pray with you about anything you need. But did any of those points hit you harder? Did something resonate with you? Are you tired of playing games? Are you tired of sitting on the sideline? Are you tired of church being something your granny was excited about? Do you want to meet the one who designed you in heaven? Today's the day that that's possible. If you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, coming down to the front and telling one of these trusted people, I'm ready to be saved today, they will pray with you. Heaven has a party and the devil gets a black eye. If you've made Jesus your Lord and Savior before and you've walked away and you're sleeping with the pigs, the Father's waiting to welcome you home. And guess what? He's not standing there snarling at you. He's running off the front porch, getting to you before you even get out of the car. He's that excited to see you, that his child is home. So if you were one of the people that thought you were going to walk in today and and the place would catch on fire, no, the Holy Spirit was waiting on you. The Lord led you to this moment. It's a beautiful moment. He led you here. If anything, that any of those questions, you're going to have time to think about it. The band's going to sing uh, through a chorus, and they're here to pray with you about anything you need prayer for. But those five questions and challenges ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you which one he's speaking to you about today and then come down and receive prayer for for whatever it is and say Lord speak to me and they'll pray courage over you strength over you discernment over you and you'll leave here better than you walked in who say amen to that so hold your hands out like this Lord we pray as we come to this altar open-handed Lord, we know where the altar is a place where things go to die And we're going to come to the altar. We're going to let these old things die. We're going to walk away being resurrected in our spirit. And Lord, may there be a boldness come on your people today that we will leave here stronger with our head held high knowing that you were in this moment and it was beautiful and God-ordained. 
So, Lord, speak to us today. Give us courage to come down front and say yes to you. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. There's communion on the sides of the, the platform. Come take communion and, and come receive prayer. And we'll end the service here shortly.